with these men, all possessed of talent, intellect, and of knowledge. Emperor loved to let the activity of his mind expiate on all manner of subjects, and each of those who was admitted to these interviews, and who, like Isabelle, Mange, Fontaine, and Talma, have left some written record, bear witness to the grace, the amiability, and the gaiety which Napoleon possessed, the grasp of the subject with which he spoke, and the power with which he stored up even the most trifling facts in his retentive memory. Often, when he had no one else to exchange a word with, he plied with questions to the prefect of the palace, who, erect with his hat under his arm, stood looking at the maitre d'hotel, waiting at table. Where was that bought? How much did that cost? And when he received an answer, he often said, It was much cheaper when I was sub-lieutenant. I will not pay dearer than others. He was compelled to pay, however, when he had in his kitchens those stifling kitchens of the Tuileries in which all seasons were alike, where no one could decay on account of the coal smoke. It was Fontaine who said this. Artistes such as Farsi, for chef, le comte, chef, le beau, head pastry cook, who was, it is said, the regenerator of French pastry, and who on entering the household of the first consul made a sensation by the pretty pièce montée of which he was the inventor. At his Quindidi dinners, Quindidi was the fifth day of the Republican week of ten days, a passage of the Bridge of Lodi, a passage of the Tagliamento, and especially a passage of the Bridge of Arcole, a barley sugar biscuit pastry, and nougat had been much admired as the work of an artist. Le Beau made all the pastry, even for the grand balls. Before he came, the pièces de monte were only supplied by Begui, pastry cook. Vivienne, we are unable to authenticate an anecdote relating to the price of a volivant bought out of the house and sent up by Rousseau, who besides was not maitre d'hotel to Napoleon, but to Josephine. It would seem to have been singularly imprudent to have dishes from a pastry cook which were intended for the imperial table, especially dishes requiring pastry crust. And this explains why Le Beau is one of the few servants in the kitchen who remained from the beginning to the end of the reign. The cooks changed very frequently. Was this an account of the bad ventilation of the kitchen or an account of the frigid economy established in the household which strictly tied them down to wages of 2,400 francs? After Guillaume, who accompanied the general to Egypt and who was pensioned off with the place of clerk, of the kitchen at Fontainebleau, after Donchet, who also made the Egyptian expedition and who had even run the risk of losing his life, went on the way back. The plate was stolen at six leagues from Aix in Provence. We find successively after 1802, Fenard de Laborde, Coulon, Farsi, Lively Pierre, the artist whom you attached to his person and who died on the return from Russia. Debray, Le Comte du Tain, Le Comte Le Moigne, Ferdinand was cook at the island of Elba. A man named Dussault was chef de cuisine during the Hundred Days. As we see, there was a constant change. But it must be added that among these names are comprised, besides those of chef de cuisine, properly so called, those of chefs of special departments, who, when a campaign began, were dispersed among the different attachments of the household in such a manner that the emperor found a complete service in almost every place to which he went. In spite of these frequent changes, it was in the old imperial household that was found, after ten fruitless attempts, the man sufficiently devoted to go to St. Helena. This was Chandelier, Page Rotisseur, in 1813, who passed into the household of Princess Pauline, and who, as soon as the proposition was made, accepted eagerly the mission of devotion which was offered him. He shared with the other servants the cares which the exile required, and his name thenceforth, Immortal, is inscribed in his will. The Emperor's study. It was very... Rarely that the emperor prolonged his destiny. It was only on the days when, as he said, he felt the necessity of shutting up in his study and of giving his brain a little repose. On most occasions, after he had taken his usual cup of coffee, he returned to his private apartments. But often, before setting to work, he went down a little staircase and paid a short visit to the empress. With Josephine, the visit coincided with the moment when she was having déjeuner with the ladies whom she had invited, and this little excitement amused the emperor for a few moments. When Marie-Louise, 
whose life was much duller. Conversation soon came to an end. Napoleon, who sat down on an armchair, allowed himself to drop off to sleep for a few moments. In the case of either of them, it was a mere appearance which he made, for business was waiting and nothing stood in the way of work. The room which Napoleon made into his study was of moderate size. It was lighted by a single window made in a corner looking into the garden. The principal piece of furniture placed in the middle was a magnificent bureau, loaded with gilt bras and supported by two griffins. The lid of the table sided into the groove so that it could be shut without disarranging the papers. Under the bureau and screwed to the floor was a sliding cupboard into which every time the emperor went out was placed a portfolio of which he alone had the king. The armchair belonging to the bureau was of antique shape. The back was covered with tapestry of green cursing mirror, the folds of which were fastened by silk cords, and the arms finished off with griffin's heads. The emperor scarcely ever sat down in his chair except to give his signature. He kept habitually to the right of the fireplace on a small sofa covered with green taffeta near to which was a stand which received the correspondence of the day. A screen of several leaves kept off the heat of the fire at the further end of the room. At right angles in the corners were placed four bookcases, and between the two which occupied the wall at the end was a great regulator clock of the same kind as that furnished in 1808 by Bailly for the study at Compiègne, which cost 4,000 francs.